Good morning. My name is Dr. Amada Mendoza. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, and I just wanted to welcome you to my series called Alive at 5. Yes, Alive at 5 a.m. Today, I'll be reading the annual report written by none other than Warren Buffett or Berkshire Hathaway. Come follow me at uh, YouTube at Doc Yoda Mendoza. This is the first series of thriving after the pandemic. It is April 2021 today. And this is my first time really trying to do something like this, uh, reading to you, trying to help you out as you thr get past this pandemic. And what do you do after COVID? Enjoy. Ah, let's see if this actually will stick over here. Hopefully you can hear me as I work out and share Berkshire Hathaway's annual report. Your workout today is a 30 minute session. I'm using a pre-core. And I'm hoping you're honest with yourself and when you're pressing your weight. <laughs> Let's see. Level two. Enter. I'm doing a weight loss program. Level two on the pre core. Hopefully you're honest when you're pressing your weight and your age. So it doesn't matter what you do for a living. Our goal is to help each other get healthier. I'm using my on cloud shoes and my pre-core for working out. Make sure you consult your physician if you have any issues before you start working out. I'm a physical therapist by trade. This is what I do for a living. I'm a father of two. And welcome to Alive with Fire. So today's topic is Berkshire Hathaway Inc.'s Shareholder Annual Report. To the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway Inc., Berkshire earned $42.5 billion in 2020, according to generally accepted accounting principles, commonly known as GAAP. The four components of that figure are $21.9 billion of operating earnings, $4.9 billion of realized capital gains, a $26.7 billion gain from an increase in the amount of net unrealized capital gains that exist in the stocks we held. And finally, an $11 billion loss from a write down in the value of a few subsidiary and affiliate businesses that we own. All items are stated on an after tax basis. Operating earnings of what count most, even during periods when they are not the largest item in our GAAP total. Our focus at Berkshire is both to increase this segment of our income and to acquire large and favorably situated businesses. Last year, however, we met neither goal. Berkshire made no sizable acquisitions and operating earnings fell 9%. We did, though, increase Berkshire's per share intrinsic value by both retaining earnings and repurchasing about 5% of our shares. Woo. This is the first time I'm exercising, 5 a.m. The new GAAP components pertaining to capital gains or losses, whether realized or unrealized, 
fluctuate capriciously from year to year, reflecting swings in the stock market. Whatever today's figures, Charlie Munger, my longtime partner and I, firmly believe that over time, Berkshire's capital gains from its investments, holdings will be substantial. Pause for water break. As I've emphasized many times, Charlie and I view Berkshire's holdings of marketable stocks at year end worth $281 billion as a collection of businesses. We don't control the operations of these of those companies, but we do share proportionally, proportionately in their long-term prosperity. From an accounting standpoint, however, our portion of their earnings is not included in Berkshire's income. Instead, only what these investors pay us in dividends is recorded on our books. Under GAAP, the huge sums that investees retain on our behalf become invisible. What's out of sight, however, should not be out of mind. Those unrecorded retained earnings are usually building value, lots of value for Berkshire. Investees use the withheld funds to expand their businesses, make acquisitions, pay off debt, and often to repurchase their stock, an act that increases our share of their future earnings. As we pointed out in these pages last year, retained earnings have propelled American businesses throughout our country's history. Well, try doing this if you're Mick Jagger. That was a side note. What worked for Carnegie and Rockefeller has over the years worked its magic for millions of shareholders as well. Of course, some of our investees will disappoint adding little, if anything, to the value of their company by retaining earnings. But others will over-deliver, a few spectacularly. In aggregate, we expect our share of the huge pile of earnings retained by Berkshire's not non-controlled businesses, what others would label our equity portfolio, to eventually deliver us an equal or greater amount of capital gains over our 56 year tenure that expectation has been met. That was page three. Page four. The final components in our GAAP figure, that ugly $11 billion right down is almost entirely the quantification of a mistake I made in 2016. That year, Berkshire purchased Precision Cast Parts, PCC, and I paid too much for the company. No one misled me in any way. I was simply too optimistic about PCC's normalized profit potential. Last year, my miscalculations was laid here, oh, laid bare by adverse developments throughout the aerospace industry. PCC's most important source of customers. In purchasing PCC, Berkshire bought a fine company, the best in its business. Mark Dunnigan, PCC CEO, is a passionate manager who consistently pours the same energy into the business that he did before we purchased it. We are lucky to have him running things. I believe I was right in concluding 
that PCC would, over time, earn good returns on the net tangible assets deployed in its operations. I was wrong, however, in judging the average amount of future earnings and, consequently, wrong in my calculations of the proper price to pay for the businesses. The business. PCC is for far from my first error of that sort, but it, it's a big one. Two strings in our bow. Berkshire is often labeled a conglomerate, a negative term applied to holding companies that own a hedge, a hodgepodge of unrealized businesses. And yes, for it, that describes Berkshire, but only in part. To understand how and why we differ from the prototype conglomerate, let's review a little history. Over time, conglomerates have generally limited themselves to buying businesses in their entirety. That strategy, however, came with two major problems. One was unsolvable. Most of the truly great businesses have no interest in having anyone take them over. Consequently, deal-hungry conglomerate jurors had to focus on so-so companies that lacked important and durable competitive strengths. That was not a great pond in which to fish. Beyond that, as conglomerate jurors dipped into this universe of mediocre businesses, they often found themselves required to pay staggering control, quote, end quote, premiums to snare their quarry. Aspiring, aspiring conglomerate tours knew the answer to this overpayment, quote, end quote, problem. They simply needed to manufacture a vastly overvalued stock of their own that could be used as a quote unquote currency for pricey acquisitions. I'll pay you $10,000 for your dog by giving you two of my $5,000 cats. Often, the tools for fostering the overvaluation of a conglomerate stock involve promotional techniques and quote imaginative end quote accounting maneuvers that were at best deceptive and that sometimes crossed the line into fraud. When these tricks were quote successful end quote, the conglomerate pushed its own stock to say three times its business value in order to offer the target two times its value. Investing illusions can continue for a surprisingly long time. Wall Street loves the fees that deal making generates. And the press loves the stories that colorful promoters provide. At a point, also, the soaring price of a promoted stock can itself become the quote, proof, end quote, that an illusion is reality. Eventually, of course, we're on page five, the party ends and many business, quote, emperors, end quote, are found to have no clothes. Financial history is replete with the names of famous conglomerate tourists who were initially lionized in business as business geniuses by journalists, analysts, and investment bankers, but whose creations ended up as business junkyards, period. Conglomerateurs or conglomerates earned their terrible reputation. Next paragraph. Charlie and I want our conglomerate to own all or part of a diverse group of businesses with good economic characteristics and good managers. 
Whether Berkshire controls these businesses, however, is unimportant to us. It took me a while to wise up, but Charlie and also my 20-year-old struggle with the textile operations I inherited at Berkshire finally convinced me that owning a non-controlling portion of a wonderful business is more profitable, more enjoyable, and far less work than struggling with 100% of a marginal enterprise. For those reasons, our conglomerate will remain a collection of controlled and non-controlled businesses. Charlie and I will simply deploy your capital into whatever we believe makes the most sense. Based on the company's durable competitive strengths, the capabilities and character of its management, management and price. If that strategy requires little or no effort on our part, so much the better. In contrast to the scoring systems utilized in diving, com in diving competitions, yes, you are awarded no points in business and diverse endeavors for degree of difficulty, quote, end quote. Furthermore, as Ronald Reagan cautioned, quote, it said that hard work never killed anyone, but I say, why take the chance, end quote. New paragraph, new heading, the family jewels and how we increase your share of those gems. On page A1, we list Berkshire's subsidiaries a smorgasbord of businesses employing 360,000 at year end. You can read much more about those controlled operations in the 10K that fills the back of this report. One major position, our, sorry, our major positions in companies that we partly own and don't control are listed on page seven of this letter. The portfolio of businesses too is large and diverse. Most of Berkshire's value, however, resides in four businesses, three controlled and one in which we have only a 5.4% interest. All four are jewels. The largest in value is our property slash casualty insurance operation which for 53 years has been the core of Berkshire. Our family of insurers is unique in the insurance field. So too is its manager, Ajit Jain, who joined Berkshire in 1986. Overall, the insurance fleet operates, operates with far more capital than is deployed by any of its competitors worldwide. That financial strength, coupled with the huge flow of cash Berkshire annually receives from its non-insurance businesses, allows our insurance companies to safely follow an equity-heavy investment strategy not feasible for the overwhelming majority of insurers. Those competitors, for both regulatory and credit rating reasons, must focus on bonds and bonds are not the place to be these days. Can you believe that the income recently available from a 10-year U.S. Treasury bond, the yield was 0.93% at year end, had fallen 94% from the 15.5 or 15.8% yield available in September 1981. In certain large and important countries, such as Germany and Japan, 
investors earn a negative return on trillions of dollars of sovereign debt. Fixed income investors worldwide, whether pension funds, insurance companies, or retirees, face a bleak future. Page six. Some insurers, as well as other bond insurers, investors, may try to juice the pathetic returns now available by diluting their purchases to obligations backed by shaky borrowers. Risky loans, however, are not the answer to inadequately or inadequate interest rates. What's that? Yes. Three decades ago, the once mighty sovereign savings and loan industry destroyed itself, partly by ignoring that maxim. Berkshire now enjoys $138 billion of insurance float, float, end quote. Funds that do not belong to us, but are nevertheless ours to deploy, whether in bonds, stocks, or cash equivalents, such as U.S. Treasury bills. Float has some similarities to bank deposits, cash flows, in and out daily to insurers, with the total they hold changing very little. The massive sum held by Berkshire is likely to remain near its present level for many years and on a cumulative basis has been costless to us. That happy result, of course, could change, but over time, I like our odds. I have repetitiously, some might say endlessly, explained our insurance operations in my annual letters to you. Therefore, I will this year ask new shareholders who wish to learn more about our insurance business and quote and float, float to read the pertinent section of the 2019 report reprinted on page A2. It's important that you understand the risks as well as the opportunities existing in our insurance activities. <sighs> Water break. Our second and most and third most valuable assets is pretty much a toss up at this point of Berkshire's 100% ownership of BNSF. America's largest railroad measured by freight volume. And our 5.4% ownership of Apple. And in the fourth spot is our 91% ownership of Berkshire Hathaway's energy. What we have here is a very unusual utility business whose annual earnings have grown from 122 billion sorry, 122 million to $3.4 billion during our 21 years of ownership. I'll have more to say about BNSF and BHE later in this letter. For now, however, I would like to focus on a practice Berkshire will periodically use to enhance your interest in both its big four as well as the many other assets Berkshire owns. Ooh, I can't believe a 90 plus year old, man, almost a hundred year old with a partner that's over a hundred years old is, can actually talk all day during his annual meeting. So going back, we're on page six, next chapter. Last year, we demonstrated our enthusiasm for Berkshire's spread of prosperities, oh, sorry, <laughs> Berkshire spread the properties by repurchasing 
the equivalent of 80,998 A shares, spending $24.7 billion in the process. That action increased your ownership in all of Berkshire's businesses by 5.2% without requiring you so much as touch a wallet. Following criteria Charlie and I have long recommended, we made those purchases because we believe they would both enhance the intrinsic value per share for continuing shareholders and would leave Berkshire with more than ample funds for any opportunities or problems it might encounter. In no way do we think that Berkshire shares should be repurchased at simply any price. I emphasize that point because American CEOs have an embarrassing record of devoting more company funds to repurchases when prices have risen than when they have tanked. Our approach is exactly the reverse. Berkshire's investments in Apple vividly illustrates the power of repurchases. We began buying Apple stock late in 2016, and by early July 2018, owned slightly more than 1 billion Apple shares, split adjusted. Saying that, I'm referencing the investment held in Berkshire's general account, and I'm excluding a very small and separately managed holding of Apple shares that was subsequently sold. When we finished our purchases in mid-2018, Berkshire's general account owned 5.2% of Apple. Our cost for that stake was $36 billion. Since then, we have both enjoyed regular dividends, averaging about $775 million annually, and have also, in 2020, pocketed an additional $11 billion by selling a small portion of our position. Despite that sale, voila, Berkshire now owns 5.4% of Apple. That increase was costless to us, coming about because Apple has continuously repurchased its shares, thereby, thereby substantially shrinking the number it now has outstanding. But that's far from all the good news. Because we also repurchased Berkshire shares during the two and a half years, you now indirectly own a full 10% more of Apple's assets and future earnings than you did in July 2018. This agreeable dynamic continues. Berkshire has repurchased more shares since year end and is likely to further reduce its share cost in the future. Apple has publicly stated an intention to repurchase its shares as well. As these reductions occur, Berkshire shareholders will not only own a greater interest in our insurance group and in BNSF and BHE, but it will also find their indirect ownership of Apple increasing as well. The math of repurchases grinds away slowly, but can be powerful over time. The process offers a simple simple way for investors to own an ever-expanding portion of exceptional businesses. And as a sultry Mae West assured us, quote, too much of a good thing can be wonderful, end quote. Thank you very much for listening to the annual shareholders report of Berkshire Hathaway. My first venue into this series called Alive with Five. I'm in no way endorsing any stocks. I'm here to share the most successful annual letters in the US history of stocks. Until then, keep on exercising, keep on keeping on, keep on thriving. We have two minutes to talk freely. The 2020 annual report can be found online for free. 
It's a must read for anyone in finance and economics. I am a lowly servant, physical therapist, the father of two, and I continue to grind, exercise, and hopefully show you some authenticity. We all struggle, and I hope that over this past year, we have kept you safe, COVID-free, and healthy. We have also helped many, many, many people through a and therapy, experience social engagement safely, and I hope you continue to support us in Suntry and in Mary Allen. Check out my YouTube videos at Doc Yoda Mendoza and my AM Health hashtag my AM health and hashtag AM physical therapy. I hope you'll continue to support us and share your wonderful tips as well. So we can all thrive in 2021. Thank you. And I have 30 seconds left of this 30 minute elliptical exercise. Again, start exercising, call your physician, get back in shape. Some people call it the COVID-15, 15 pounds we gained from being sedentary, and we gotta get back in shape. Till next time, thank you very much for tuning in. Alive with Five with Doc Amada Mendoza. God bless you.